Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and this is the Political Postbox where we take a look at about half a dozen comments that have appeared on the channel from the past week and I add my own thoughts onto them. And this week, well, the dual spectres of Brexit and Covid are on the menu. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. Now, the first one I'm going to bring up seems a quite innocuous one. Um, but this is very much the pattern that's been going on with Prime Minister's questions. Keir Starmer asks a reasonable question. Boris Johnson, his response is, how dare you? And it's quite right. But it's not just Keir Starmer. It's absolutely anyone that asks a question of Boris Johnson. We need to bear in mind. Very recently, Boris Johnson attended a liaison committee meeting. Now, the liaison committee, for those who don't know, is the select committee in Parliament whose job is specifically to ask questions of the Prime Minister. In other words, that is a form of prime ministerial scrutiny that is supposed to exist in Parliament. Boris Johnson doesn't really turn up to them, so they haven't actually happened for a year, other than the one that happened a uh, week before last. I think it was the week before last. What was it last week? It's quite recently. And um, even in that one, Boris Johnson's attitude was very much of, I, I shouldn't be doing this. Are you asking me questions? Who are you to ask me questions? And, you know, it's the same thing on um, various you know, television shows where they'll ask ministers questions. Boris Johnson has banned any minister from going on Good Morning Britain, for example, which has actually massively boosted its ratings because one of the hosts there, Piers Morgan, all round knob edge, uh, most times is actually or was doing a really good job of putting ministers under the cosh over their COVID response and um, remarkable really remarkable considering his politics but there we go uh, so now Boris Johnson said no ministers can go on it to which they all breathed a sigh of relief because they didn't really like going on it but at least now they can say oh sorry I'd love to come on it but you know what the Prime Minister says I can't uh, he's also you know they're not attending like Channel 4 news any anyone that will ask him an awkward question, he he becomes outraged at. You know, in America, you may be thinking, "Well, this sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it?" Uh, the orange one has very much the same attitude, um, and it is. And really, you have to think to yourself, "What is the reason for this?" And you only have to look something that people have been increasingly doing. You only really have to look at Boris Johnson's life, because all of his life he has considered himself and been allowed to consider himself exceptional and not just in the old Etonian way you know the way that lots of privileged people will go through the, the you know one of the more famous private schools in this country Eton and uh, you know and, and be conditioned to become exceptional he was even for them you know I talked about this recently lots of people are talking about the fact that even at Eton he was considered uh, to be to, to think himself even more exceptional than he should have been doing with with no reason to do so. It's not like he had a first class mind. It's not like he was, you know, the best at sports or anything like this. He was, you know, he didn't work at anything and therefore he didn't excel at every, anything. And yet he still behaved as if people should put him on a pedestal. And that's how he's been. The way he treated his girlfriends you know, right from an early age, I'm sorry, right from an uh, early age, well, relatively early age, teenage age, um, it was known, you know, very, lots of people have known him through his life would say, well, you know, his attitude to his girlfriend would be, I am not going to be faithful to you. You're going to have to deal with that. And I want you to do all my skivvying for me. I want you to you know, do my laundry and things like this. And that's what they accepted. And, and he's gone through life finding people that would accept these outrageous conditions and, and being someone who's wealthy as well doesn't have to surround himself with people who will question him or call him to account or say, no, I'm afraid you're wrong. You know, and when he moved into politics, it hardly got any better because although there's any number of people as a politician will tell you you're wrong, you can easily just dismiss that as well. That's because they don't agree with me politically, you know. They're, they're, they're the opposition, of course, they're going to criticise me. But you don't have to take the criticism seriously because you can just call it party politics. And this is where we are now. We're, we're, where we are now with a prime minister who has no skills. He may have talents, but he has no skills because he hasn't worked at any skills. No idea what he's doing. 
still surrounding himself but with yes men and women i mean the vacuous articles he has in cabinet that have got no real the the closest he got to a cabinet colleague with any backbone was of course sajid javid the former chancellor and the reason he's the former chancellor is because boris johnson tried to impose conditions on him that sajid javid said no self-respecting cabinet minister would ever accept that and promptly did one um and, you know, and that's where we are now. And and that's why he is so outraged at Keir Starmer, because the liaison committee, he turned up once, he refused to commit to turning up ever again. <laughs> so he won't turn up for a good long while for that. He might turn up again, maybe when he's fortified himself in a year's time. Um, You know, he can, he can avoid being asked awkward questions by journalists, by just only inviting those who will play by his rules. But the one person he has to face every now and then, at least, is the leader of the opposition. There's nothing he can do about that. And, and Keir Starmer, as leader of the opposition, gets six questions at Prime Minister's Questions. There'll be other times in debates as well when he may have to face him. And there's nothing he can do about that. And, and so he has to put up with it. And he doesn't like it because he's not necessarily a stupid man. And, and being asked all these questions... He will know, his own intelligence will, will explain to him, treating him as if his intelligence and him is a different thing, um, will explain to him that he's not answering the question because he's not able to answer the question because he has no good answer to the question. And it does genuinely enrage him. Some of his bluff and bluster is an act, absolutely. But every now and then, yeah, he does get asked a question where he actually just genuinely loses it. Absolutely fatal fatal because then everyone sees this so yeah i mean that's that's the reason as i see it in terms of why it is that boris johnson really hates being asked questions because he doesn't work at knowing the answers he know but like anyone else he doesn't like to be ignorant you know there are people of different levels of intelligence it's quite weird isn't it but no one ever likes to think of themselves as thick people are quite happy you know to acknowledge that they're not fit I'm not fit. Yeah, and that's fine. You can say, oh, yeah, I'm not very fit. That's okay. You know, physically. But somehow, you're not allowed to say that you're intellectually not very fit. Weird, isn't it? It is weird. But that's what's going on with Boris Johnson. He doesn't condition his brain. He's never developed his brain. So his brain is atrophied. And he, and he hates the fact that he has to face up to that reality against someone who is not only way more intelligent, but exposing the fact that Boris Johnson is way less intelligent. But anyway, that's the first one. Uh, on to the next one. So, I'll read the thing through, then I'll provide the context in my response to this. It says that the public will see you don't need as many MPs sucking off the pub public tit. Good and better, there's some horrible images appearing here to run the country. And who knows, the next referendum may be on reduction of numbers, but I expect more MPs will be against that than Brexit. Um... You cannot have a situation where you would want to reduce the number of MPs. Now, the, the author of this, um, unfortunately, I, I suspect is blissfully unaware, uh, unless they watch this now, that actually Boris Johnson's promised in the manifesto, which he's now going to try and deliver on, to reduce the number of MPs. Now, that should give you pause for thought. Boris Johnson, who wishes to remove any one who might scrutinise him, the Supreme Court, other MPs, you know, anyone, um, wants to reduce the number of MPs. Ask yourself why that is. The more MPs you have, the more democratic any system is. Because with fewer MPs, here are a few problems. First of all, if you've got fewer MPs, you're concentrating more power into the hands of smaller number of people. Straight away, you are going to have a less diverse power base in the country. It's that simple. I mean, we've been talking early on today about the lack of representation of, of, of black MPs in cabinet. There's none at all. If you reduce the number of MPs, you reduce the pool because this country is predominantly white. Uh, so ethnic minorities, some of whom, you know, you might actually get a, a slightly larger proportion in Parliament than exists in the country at large because of injustices amongst ethnic minorities that, that turn people onto politics and, and motivate people to get involved in politics. But you are going to restrict that field if you reduce the number of MPs. 
Then again, just on the individual level, when we're talking about corruption, if you've got a smaller number of people that hold power, it's easier to bribe them, corrupt them. You know, so, it, you know, the, the a prime minister has a much easier job or, or a, a, a corrupt media or anyone has a much easier job of getting enough MPs to support what they need them to support if there's a smaller number of them. And, and also another thing is, uh, if you look at the Conservatives, for example, how do they keep doing so well in Middle England? Because they focus all their efforts there. South of England, where the majority of people in the UK live, they focus all their efforts there. This is why people in the north of England, but most especially in Scotland and Wales, um, Northern Ireland, although that's politically very, very different, feel disenfranchised because Conservatives focus all their sweets so to speak, that they'll give away on a part of the country where most of the seats are. So, of course, the, when you're outside of that, you'll feel disenfranchised. And the further away from it, the more you'll feel disenfranchised. If you had more MPs, it's more difficult for them to do that because it's not democratic, really. You know, you, you can argue, you know, you're looking at, OK, they're going to do nice things for more than half of the constituents. That's fine, but they're completely abandoning the rest. It's very much like Brexit, isn't it? Brexit. So at the time, in terms of the number of people who voted, 52% voted for Brexit, 48 didn't. So the 48% apparently are supposed to be completely ignored. That's democracy, apparently. No, it's not. Obviously, in a binary situation like, do you leave the EU or do you not? OK, you may have to take the majority view on that. Although we really should have had another one since. But OK, you can, if you want to argue we take that binary view, that's fine. OK. But you can't argue in a situation where who do you, who does the government help? Oh, we'll just help the ones who are in this little pocket because they mostly vote for us. We won't help the rest. No, you're supposed to help the whole country. So the more MPs you have, the better. And another thing about fewer MPs, finally, <laughs> the fewer MPs you have, the, more pe the larger the constituency needs to be in terms of how many people are in it. So that means you've got people are less likely to know what their MP is about. You know, it's simple. If we had a, a system of democracy where actually you elected someone in a small region, a few thousand people, so I'm not suggesting you have constituents of just a few thousand, but you have a hierarchical system. But if you were just, if, if, a, if like a parish type thing where you were going to elect a representative just consist of a few thousand voters, actually a few thousand voters can get to know their representative quite well can get around that whereas if you're in a constituency with a hundred thousand people uh, there's no way the MP can get around a hundred thousand people no chance not in a whole year not in five years can't be done um, but so again you, you're going to have that distance the, the the fewer MPs there are the more people there are voting for each MP the more distance there is between the MP and the voter and that plays again into the hands of those who would seek to corrupt democracy we should have more MPs. Anyway, those are just a few reasons why this would be an absolute disaster uh, of an idea. And it is something that Boris Johnson wants to do. He wants to completely reduce the number of MPs. Next one. So, classic one, this one, classic one. But this one particularly, again, says... Uh, now, I'll add the context at the start for this one. Now, this one was about... Businesses in Northern Ireland talking about relocating, moving out of Northern Ireland because of the difficulties in trading with Great Britain. That is crucial to understanding what I'm going to say about this statement. As a result of the fact that Boris Johnson has not implemented the Northern Ireland Protocol. So no one really knows how trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain is going to work. So someone's saying here, clearly Northern Ireland is going to take a hit on Brexit. I mean, everyone is. But yes, absolutely. Northern Ireland. However, they do have a guarantee that when they want, they can have a vote on reunification, correct? They want to be in the EU and they have a path to rejoin the EU. They are less stuffed than the rest of us. Now, there's a couple of things about this. First of all, I'll just say the thing um, that I've responded to a couple of people actually on this. Reunification was a classic response on all of the issues with Brexit up until the end of last year because... The Northern Irish situation really, whenever you try and take a Brexit path, 
you basically get caught, you get blocked by Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland is a very strange situation where if you are a citizen of Northern Ireland, you can basically behave as if you're British or you can behave as if you're, well, you are Irish, but you know, like a, a citizen of the Republic of Ireland is what I mean. You can even behave as if you're part of a, of a unified Ireland that's a very strange little province that has its own assembly and all the rest of it if you want. Um, it's sort of there, you know, you can sort of squint your eyes and imagine you any sort of citizen really, and that is enshrined in law and that's your right. Or you can be both, you can have an Irish passport and a British passport, no problem at all, or neither, whichever you wish. And that is made very difficult by Brexit because it all worked perfectly fine whilst the whole of the United Kingdom was, well, it still is in, the customs union uh, of the EU and particularly helpful when we were a member of the EU. Now we're not a member, we're still in the customs union, but we're not going to be. It makes it very, very tricky. And so a lot of the response I kept getting last year was, oh, reunify, reunify. Well, eventually that will happen. But it wouldn't solve the Brexit problem because it would take some years. Like even when it's established that there is a, a legal, because it is, you're right, it, it's legally enshrined that when there's an indication, um, I'm not 100% sure on what that indication is, but you know we'll see when the census is done next week, the next week, next year, sorry. But when there is an indication that a border poll will be worth taking, then they will be allowed that vote. Now, obviously, people of Republic of Ireland get a say in it too. But as, as far as I know, that wouldn't be an, a major issue. I know there are some that would be a bit hesitant about it, but I don't think on, on balance it'd be a major issue. So Northern Ireland absolutely has a legal route to reunification in a way that Scotland, for example, doesn't have a legal route towards ununification. <laughs> Um, but uh, it didn't solve Brexit because even when that happens, it takes time for every... The border poll will take about half a year. Then, I mean, look at what we've had to try and do to extricate ourselves from the EU. It's taking years and years, just from the legal side of it, never mind the politics. And the same thing will happen in Northern Ireland. You know, there will actually have to be discussions. Don't imagine it's as simple as going, right, we're just going to change all these British laws into Irish laws. No, that's part of it. And that will take a long time. But you've also got to decide what to do. What if people in Northern Ireland want to keep their assembly? How do you then fold that in? Or do you just get rid? There's so many things would have to be discussed and then implemented. It would take years. But in this particular topic, reunification doesn't help in the slightest, even long term. Because the particular issue I was talking about was businesses who rely upon trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain across the Irish Sea. And that isn't helped by your reunification at all. Not in the, if it reunified tomorrow, that problem is still there and is just as big. It doesn't even get to become a smaller problem. If anything, it could be a larger problem because at the moment, with Northern Ireland being part of the UK, the onus is on Boris Johnson to do something, even though he's not doing anything. Imagine if if Northern Ireland was just some other foreign land, even though he treats it like that anyway. He wouldn't have to do anything. He would just say, oh, well, you're stuffed then, aren't you? Just like he is doing with businesses in Republic of Ireland, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in France, everywhere else that's quite close to us that likes to trade with us. He's not giving them any special considerations. So, no, I mean, this is one issue. And I, I, I should have known, I should have known that the reunification response would come. This is one issue that it would not help at all. Um, absolutely would not help. And, and even, you know, if you're thinking down the line, years in the future, and they'll readjust their economy. Everyone needs to trade with their closest neighbours. This is the fallacy of the Brexiteer that understanding that this doesn't have to happen. It always happens. Everyone trades most with people much closer to them. It's more convenient apart from anything else. It costs less as well. So there is always going to be trade between Northern Ireland and, and the northwestern part of England and, and North Wales, for example. Always going to have a lot of that trade because they're physically, geographically quite close. 
So even years down the line, you're going to have to come up with, or we're going to have to come up with some way of facilitating that. Um, whether Northern Ireland is part of a United Ireland or whether they're still part of a UK, it makes no difference. Anyway, next one. Right, longish one. Let's have a read of this verse. <laughs> um, it says, this was an almost inevitable outcome. I'm going to have to read the whole thing because I've forgotten what it's talking about now. It says, we're likely to see another significant rise in unemployment and people won't be, oh, I remember, won't be able to buy food that's produced to the same standard as we currently produce or source from the EU due to increase in price and having less money. Add to this the difficulties we will have trying to keep the shelves from looking completely empty come December and January. Panic buying. Also remember December, Christmas. A lot of people get buying then, don't they? Um, we will need to fill them up with something and it better be cheap. What other cheap source can we find? In expectation of all this, the government needs to reduce our standards to allow it to be imported. I would expect this to be followed by a bill to remove food labelling for country of origin requirements and such. Then the unwashed masses will not be able to immediately see that the food is coming from a country that has much lower standards. Now, a few things here. So yeah, this is talking about the fact that we're already laying the groundwork, the legal groundwork to obliterate food standards in the UK in order to facilitate the US trade deal. Now, there's a, I'll pick out a few things at random here. So it says here, I would expect this to be followed by a bill to remove food labelling for country of origin requirements. Um, I mean, that's not, you don't need to be Nostradamus for that one. That's in the US trade proposals that were published over a year ago. That's what they want us to do and that's what we will do. So people, for example, so let's look at the chlorinated chicken issue and or hormone injected beef, whatever. And, and people will be looking at us as well, you know, I just won't buy it. And there's a couple of things to that. First of all, I mean, I'm going to say that's quite a selfish view because you might not or you may not intend to, but ultimately there's a lot of people already cannot afford food and, and they're going to have to. So this is going to be a healthcare crisis, which again, disproportionately affects the poorest. It is not an attitude to have, I think, in, in for someone who wants an equitable society. But the other thing is, you think you won't be buying it. But how do you know? Because as the person says, the US don't, they know that chlorinated chicken in the UK will be extremely unpopular and it will not sell except to the poorest. And that's not enough. They want to sell it to as many people as possible. And that basically means hiding the fact that it is what it is. Um, so labeling laws will be changed. Now, the problem then is, how do you know? And you might look at it, well, the cheap stuff with the chlorinated chicken, how do you know? There's an awful, you can get an awful lot of gamesmanship um, in retail. Sometimes cheap things are priced a bit higher to make it look better than it is, to make it think, oh, this is the, the better product. It's not always the case. It's sometimes just a bit of gamesmanship. Sometimes you can have identical standards of, of product, price different, different labels on them, priced differently but they're the same. And uh, that is what will happen here. And I said before, the only way you will know that the chicken you are buying is, is not chlorinated is if that chicken is still alive when you buy it. Maybe, I mean, where I am at the moment with our girlfriend, I mean, this is a fairly agricultural area. I know there's some chicken farms. You know, maybe if, if you're in a, an area like that and you can follow it all through, you know the farm and you know where it's been butchered and, and sold and, and you you know the path because it's local to you and you can find out maybe then uh, but of course that will cost more um but absolutely and, and don't think oh if you just buy organic or anything that'll help because that's just how the chicken is reared got nothing to do with how it's it's processed after its life is ended um so yeah it's going to be quite tricky that but in terms of other things here in, in you know so the, the shelves are going to be empty uh, next year. That's inevitable. We know that. The government know that. Uh, and unlike with the panic, because panic buying, uh, and unlike with the panic buying where, you know, there wasn't actually a drop in supply, um, so you could refill the shelves, there will be in this case because it will be caused by a, a block in supply. And like the government says it's going to have to fill those shelves politically to remain it's all right blame at that point it'll be all right blaming foreigners for it blame them as much as you like 
the fact of the matter will be that it will be our fault uh, and it doesn't matter whether people see that or not. People don't care whose fault it is. If, they're, if, if they are haven't got any dinner, they don't give them monkeys. What they know is that they elected a government in place to deal with this and they're not doing. And as I've said all the way through Brexit, a government can get away with abusing a population in all manner of ways. But you... What was the phrase? Someone said something, oh, centuries ago now. You know, any... Oh, it was a long time ago anyway. Uh, any society is only like three meals away from anarchy or something like that, some variation on that theme. And and that's, you know, and I think that is based on, on, a, on a truism that you you deprive people of their food and it can be in different shades of grey. You know, peop some people may be physically deprived of food. They actually won't be able to get any food at all. For the middle classes, it may be not being able to get the range of foods they want. At the moment, we can't. Do you know what I really like for having my lunch? Heinz Mulligatoni soup can't get it now and I I was thinking back to when the the panic buying started in this country with COVID I know that supermarkets were telling their suppliers to focus on a smaller range of products and I think that's what they've done I think I haven't looked it up to find out if it's true I reckon Heinz have knocked Mulligatoni on the head which is annoying we're getting this other type of Mulligatoni now which is all right it's fine it's not as nice so middle class assholes like me will be moaning about the range of food. Well, that's just as bad. We'll still be, you know, shaking our fists at the government over that. You know, all a matter of scale. Um, so, the, yeah, the government, absolutely, you're right. They are absolutely going to have to work out some way. And I don't know how they're going to do it. They are going to have to work out some way of making sure the shelves do not stay empty for long. They can blame it on panic buying to begin with, but people will remember the panic buying from COVID and actually it sorted itself out a few weeks later. There's still the odd product, but not as many. Mostly baking products. People keep baking cakes for Christ's sake. So um, we're going to need some emergency uh, diet books flown into the country. But anyway... That's yeah, you're right. That's what they're going to have to do. They're they're going to have to get involved. They won't be able to just leave it to supermarkets to sort this one. They're going to have to get involved and and work out how they con us that the shelves aren't empty at all because they're going to be. Uh, next one. Yes. Okay. So work from home if you can. And this is a quotation from the government prime minister. Any number of ministers have said this was the government's instruction. MPs have been doing so, so obviously can. More breaking the rules by the rulers then. It, it, absolutely, and it is baffling to me that the media, the mainstream media, have not taken this on, on more so. That we know that MPs can work from home. We know that because they were doing. Now the government has ordered MPs to physically return to Parliament and they've whipped their MPs to vote in favour of the measures, which they duly did. And then the day after someone became ill with symptoms, tested negatively since. But, you know, that still doesn't mean they can breathe a sigh of relief. How many asymptomatic colleagues will they have brushed past? But it, it is another, following on from the Dominic Cummings, it's another classic case of the government saying the rules don't apply to us. You know, obviously they, they fell over themselves to say the rules didn't apply to Dominic Cummings. Even by getting... MPs in, in here, um, they've said the rules don't apply to them because they weren't distancing properly at all. They weren't wearing face masks. And yet, as you say here, you know, they're also breaking the rule. When, when the Prime Minister was asked, when he changed his stay at home message to stay alert, what is your message to people? And he said, work from home if you can. But if you can't, then you need to go. And it is absolutely another case of this government saying yeah these rules are for you not for us and it's things like this that need to be remembered and need to be regurgitated uh, because it it is breathtaking arrogance because like I, I was talking about last week they don't even gain anything from this there is no benefit to Boris Johnson or his government no political benefit no practical benefit in forcing MPs to return He's done it just because they have so much hubris that they don't have to pay attention to the rules, that they don't apply to them. And this is a prime minister 
who actually contracted COVID and people were asking at the time, is this going to, you know, give him a bit of humble pie? Is he, is he going to rethink things a bit? No, not a bit of it. He's, he, he's now probably carrying on thinking he's immune to everything now because he's already caught it and survived. I know that's fine then. There we are. Anyway, last one. All right, long one. I'm not going to read this whole lot out, but I'll give you the gist. So I'll, I'll try and read bits out and just go, ooh, the regulations. Uh, the real question is, is Brexit a money-making enterprise since the regulation of the European Parliament and the Council of blah, 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 on prudential requirements for credit institutions and investment firms and amending regulations, blah, 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 that set out to limit the purely for profiteering bets upon financial crisis since 2008, it has been difficult for city hedge fund managers to earn a dishonest buck. Considering London had long surpassed, although since Brexit has been in steep decline, other financial centres, including Wall Street, because of its role within the EU as its principled financial hub. But since this legislation bound investments to a more ethical and risk reduced strategy, then there has been a concerted effort to break the EU's prohibition and of this kind of profiteering, the straw that broke the, broke the camel's back was, of course, the tax evasion directive, uh, anti-tax avoidance directive, that is, uh, that also prevented hedge funds from hiding money in Britain's old colonial possessions and dominions, yeah, Cayman Islands and so on, for example. Yes, um, I mean, in terms of it's harder to make a dishonest book now, I mean, don't feel so too sorry for the hedge fund managers. They've been making out very nicely during Brexit because it works like this. So assuming you're a Tory donor or in with the Tories in some regard, they will let you know when they're about to say something that rallies the value of the pound. I notice, for example, that the pound against the dollar has gone up recently quite a bit in the last few days. But I didn't I haven't checked yet whether that is because the pound has rallied somehow. Can't really imagine that's the case. Or maybe it is because, you know, we've eased the lockdown. Maybe that's it. Or whether the arse has fallen out of the dollar. Could be a combination of the two, actually. Um, but generally speaking, when you need the pound to be, you know, valued higher, Boris Johnson can do it really easily. Like at the moment, if he wanted the pound to go up next week, all he'd have to do is to talk about thinking about extending the transition period, the Brexit transition period. Yes, we're going to consider it very carefully and we'll make our decision in the next week. Pound goes up. If he wants to devalue the pound, all he has to do is say something that looks like he's going to go over the cliff edge, you know, um, which will be quite easily done. So the value of the pound is almost certain to drop at the end of this month as a result. Of, almost certain. It is certain. Let's face facts. And so let's say you're in with the, the government and you know when they're going to be making these announcements. So what you do, it's really very simple, is you, well, the short in the pound ultimately works as follows in, in, in simple terms. You basically borrow shares in the pound in sterling and then you sell them. <laughs> you sell them when the value is high. So you get all that money. But they weren't your shares. You've got to give them back. So you're going to have to buy them back at some point. That's fine. You've made your money. So then you wait for the value of the pound to drop. And then at that time, that's when you buy the shares back and then you give them back because you only borrowed them or leased them. There's a fee to it. Um, and then you, you pocket the difference. You pocket the profit there. Uh, and that's how that works. That's quite simple. Um, it's a really weird thing to exist. This mechanism for doing this is really weird that it exists, but it does. Now, I'm sure economists will be able to say there's some good reason for it. I don't know. But now, normally that would be a bit of a bet. Normally what you would do is this would be a little bit of a form of gambling. As an economist, you might try and judge, OK, well, I think the economy is going to go like this. So I will sell at this time, buy at this time. But of course, if you're in the know, it's a sort of insider trading, really, isn't it? If you're in the know about when the government's going to make these decisions that are absolutely going to make the value of the pound rise or fall, then you are guaranteed to make a lot of money. And because it's not really a gamble, you can also throw much more money in it. And there's a, a small, well, I say a small number of individuals, it's hundreds of people, a relatively small number of hedge fund managers have uh, made out like bandits at various times, and they're going to do so again. They are absolute. We know that they're already betting. 
we've you know people that are following these guys know that they're already betting on uh, a hard Brexit at the end of this year because that's the way their investments have gone. They're absolutely banking on it. Um, and and yeah, and it's this sort of behaviour that that was trying to be curtailed by the EU, which is absolutely why you know a group of people because not everyone in favor of brexit or push brexit was doing it for this reason but there were an awful lot of people who were i think one of my most videos was, was on this very topic the anti-tax avoidance directive um yeah and absolutely the the fact that the eu didn't like the idea that london was behaving um you know like a, a no man's land in financial terms a, a black market um, terrible amount of money laundering goes on in London. In fact, when taken, you know, people always think about when you're thinking about financial irregularities, banking irregularities, you think about Switzerland, but, and, and you're right to do so. Uh, but actually, when you consider British overseas territories as well, like the Cayman Islands, um, Britain and its territories combined form the the worst money laundering and dirty dealing and tax avoidance in the world you know we're we're crooks quite frankly financial crooks and those but those crooks you know like the mob uh in depression era america pay pay the right people in politics to make sure that they you know and what have they paid them to do on this particular occasion they've paid them to completely sink the united kingdom causing almost certainly the breakup of the United Kingdom politically, but also economically crashing it. All just so for a small number of people who were already wealthy and were going to live their lives in luxury could have a bit more money that they're not even going to spend because they have everything they need already. But there it is. I'll leave you on that uh, happy little note. Hope you found the video interesting this week. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. Until next time, I'll see you later.